Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, you know, I had the great privilege and honor to meet both Clyde and Patsy Tombaugh uh, at their home in Las Cruces. And also they came on a trip when, they, when Clyde was uh, raising funds for a, uh, a fellowship at New Mexico State University. He came to Boston um, and uh, he stayed at my house. <laughs> and so we have a little plaque. Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto, slept here <laughs> September 13th, 1987. Um, and I think you all know Clyde as the professional. I think you all know him as the, as the discoverer of Pluto. But there is so much more to his story and to the story of his wife, Patsy. Uh, and so we have uh, brought here today their two children to tell you that story. And so please join me in welcoming Annette and Alden Tamba. Dad was born in his mother's parents' home near Streeter, Illinois, and on February 4th, 1906. This is a picture of Clyde as a toddler. Notice the dress. In the early 1900s, male toddlers wore dresses. This 1909 family photo is of Clyde and his younger sister, Esther, and their parents, Muren and Adela. Clyde's father, Muren, drew this picture of the Burdette, Kansas farm in 1922. When I was in the fourth grade, I became intensely interested in geography. And uh, I learned it well, and in uh, fact, by the time I was in the sixth grade, I could bound every country in the world from memory. Well, then the thought occurred to me, what would the geography be like on the other planets? So that was my natural uh, interest into astronomy, you see. So I've been interested in that area particularly ever since. Of course, uh, I took all the science and math that I that, uh, offered in high school, and uh, I had an uncle in Illinois who, uh, we lived in Illinois, and he's about nine miles from us, and he was an amateur astronomer. And he had a three-inch telescope, and uh, uh, so the views with that telescope were my first views of the rings of Saturn and Jupiter's moons and the craters on the moon. Dad loved sports and was involved in many, sco many school track and field programs. One of Clyde's best events was the pole vault, and the other was the shot put. Dad made many telescopes during his life. The first one he made was in 1928. It was an eight inch. And in dad's words, everything he could do wrong, he did wrong. <laughs> We've all had some of those experiences. And dad read more and he, he experimented more after that failure. And in 1927, he built a seven inch a Newtonian reflector for his uncle Lee. And uncle Lee was the one that actually got him interested in astronomy and observation through telescopes. Uh, after he finished that telescope, which was an excellent telescope, he bought the mirror for the nine inch Newtonian reflector uh, and he built the telescope with a focal length ideal for planetary observation. He finished that telescope in the fall of 1928 and that, he says, was the best telescope that he had ever built. Well, yes, there's a very strong curiosity about the universe and so on. Uh, I just had the urge to see on the other side of the mountain, you see. Uh, I wanted to see what's on the moon and the planets and all that, you see. I uh, wanted to extend my horizon of interest. It is a challenge to my thought life. With the nine-inch telescope, Dad drew sketches of his planetary viewings of Jupiter and Mars and sent them to Lowell Obser Observatory in December of 1928 for the critique on the correctness of his observations. 
And Dad received a job offer from a Wichita, Kansas telescope maker because he had sent some of the blanks that he had done to the telescope maker for um, putting the mirroring image on them. He also received a letter from VM Slifer at Lowell Observatory asking Dad if he would be interested in coming to Lowell Observatory on a trial basis as a junior observer. And Dad elected the adventure of the unknown and he boarded a train to Flagstaff on January the 14th, 1929, which happened to be the same day that his youngest sister was born. Being invited to come to Flagstaff was a big stroke of luck. Uh, the other was pluck. Um, I, I really, uh, not really realizing I had been preparing myself for that for years before that, you see. Look at the telescope, learn to find objects in the sky, reading everything in astronomy I could get, you see. So, uh, and to be very careful, I was somewhat of a professionist, you see. And that was a, those were the traits that made it uh, uh, as a good candidate for this type of a job. And Dad was one of the most dedicated individuals I've ever known and that my sister's ever known. You uh, carry on through even in spite of discouraging situations and you never lose sight of the goal. And often you, have, you experience hardships involved, like freezing in a cold dome at night and so on, uh, loss of sleep, uh, that gets pretty wicked. But uh, I was interested in getting the results, you see. So it takes a dedication to, to achieve that kind of thing. A lot of people would give up and quit. And I did not know that I had recorded the image of Pluto on those plates, not until I scanned them later in February. And so uh, you pass your gaze over all these stars to see, you have to be conscious of seeing every star image because you don't know which one's going to shift, if any of them shift. And so it's a, a very tedious work, and you go through thousands, tens of thousands of star images, you see. Well, I came to one place where it actually was, turned the next field, there it was. Instantly, I knew I had a planet beyond orbit of Neptune because I knew the amount of shift was what fitted the situation. And that was the most instantaneous thrill you can imagine. It just electrified me. Well, I told the assistant director across the hall from me, uh, this machine makes a, makes a clicking noise and you could be heard in that part of the building. And his office across the hall, and he said, uh, of course, he understood the uh, blinking business, too. He'd been involved in some of the earlier searches. And he said, uh, I heard the clicking suddenly stop in a long silence. And he, he surmised I had run onto something, you see. And uh, so I was checking out the third plate and all that kind of thing. And here this poor man was sitting at his desk in terrible suspense, waiting to be invited in for a look, you see. I didn't know about that until he told me later. Well, I showed him the plates, the dates, and all that. Uh, everything seemed to be consistent with uh, putting the object beyond the orbit of Neptune, and I went down and told the director. He came up and looked and so on. So uh, the low observatory uh, was changed from that day on. <laughs> Dr. Slavery, the director, he had gone through the Plato field and missed Pluto one year earlier. He missed it on the plates. He was doing blinking. He wanted to be the one to find Pluto, and he failed. So I suppose he probably felt a little chagrined, but, uh, uh, but he realized and knew that I had something because the aspects were, were very convincing. And uh, so then uh, they got in touch with the observatory trustee who was living in Massachusetts. He's Lowell's nephew and told him about it. And so it was kept secret for a few weeks so we could follow it and you get to learn more about it, so you get published more about it when it came out, because we knew that when it was announced, it had been an avalanche, you see, and it was, it exceeded what we expected. Pluto was the god of the underworld, or lower, lower, lower world, I guess it'd be better to say, of Hades. Um, Pluto's out there far from the sun, where sunlight is uh, the average distance. Sunlight is only one sixteen hundredth as bright as on Earth, uh, rather dark. And if you think of uh, Hades as a dimly lighted place or outer darkness, it kind of fits in somewhat with the characteristics of Pluto, probably, or the Hades. So it seemed fairly appropriate from that standpoint. And then when the satellite of Pluto was discovered in 1978 uh, by Christie at the Naval Observatory, uh, he named it 
Sharon, and his wife's name was Charlene. <clears throat> now, Sharon was the boatman who ferried the souls of the dead across the river Styx to Pluto's realm of Hades. So the satellite name fits in very well with Pluto, you see. Dad received the Jackson Gwilt Medal from the Royal Astronomical Society of England for his discovery of Pluto. He also received one of his most favored honors, a full scholarship to the University of Kansas, KU. This is one of the KU buildings. Dad started his college education at KU in 1932, which surprised several of his professors of elementary astronomy. Dad was living in ordinary campus housing at KU. One of his classmates, James Edson, told Dad that his mother had a room for rent. And Dad rented that room, which led to his best discovery you guessed it, Patricia Edson, my mom. <laughs> in 1934, Dad was preparing for his summer work assignments at Lowell, and he asked Patricia if she would accompany him to Lowell that summer. Patricia, Patsy, told Dad that she considered his statement a proposal of marriage, and she certainly wouldn't go with him without being married. <laughs> in June 1934, Dad and Patsy were married at Patsy's mother's home in Lawrence, Kansas. Dad and Mom were then off to Lowell and their adventures on Mars Hill. They lived in a small house near Lowell's administration building. In 1936, Dad earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in astronomy from the University of Kansas. During part of the summers, Dad continued his search for trans-Neptunian objects at Lowell and each fall returned to KU with Mom. For several years in August, Dad and Mom went to the family farm near Burdett, Kansas to help with the annual wheat harvest. This picture shows Dad, his family, and my mom on a combine harvester. In 1939, Dad received his master's degree in astronomy, and Mom received her bachelor's degree in philosophy. A college degree was Mom's dream, and her family didn't have the money for a girl's education, which was kind of rare at that time, after her father died unexpectedly. Dad and Mom again returned to Lowell, where Dad continued his extensive search and mapping of the skies, and Mom involved herself in civic activities. I was born in Flagstaff in 1940. Our family, shortly after I was born, moved to down the hill to a house that was a bit larger in Flagstaff, Arizona. The house was on Aspen Street. Many years later, the house was due to be torn down, but was saved by Steve Schoner and moved to a new address about a half a block from the original. As some of you know, World War II really changed a lot of lives and everybody that was living in the United States at that time. And in 1941, Dad was asked to teach navigation to Navy pilots at the Northern Arizona State Teachers College in Flagstaff. He continued his observation duties at Lowell Observatory while teaching navigation, and he also was appointed the Civil Defense Director, or Commander actually, for Flagstaff and Coconino County. And then I was born in 1945. He was born in Flagstaff too. After the war ended in 1945, Mom and Dad accepted one-year teaching, pos uh, teaching positions at UCLA in California. When Dad returned to Lowell in 1946, he was told that because of the budget concerns, his position had been eliminated. Dad accepted a teaching position at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Mom's brother, the same one that had told Dad originally about the room that was for rent, is James Edson. And while he was working with the Department of the Army, he was instrumental in the organization of White Sands Proving Ground after the war. Uh, Uncle James convinced Dad that the country's rocket and space research needed Dad's talents to establish an optical missile tracking system at White Sands Missile Range. After much discussion about abandoning the UNM teaching position, Clyde agreed to the challenge of White Sands. 
as chief of optical in instrumentation at White Sands, Dad designed many tracking telescopes and discarded, used many discarded gun mounts as their mounting apparatus for the telescopes that he and actually my Uncle James designed and uh, did a lot of the assembly work on. And several of the placement locations were rather difficult to access and they required special transportation. I really didn't get a chance to ride on this, thank heavens. And while at White Sands, Dad also developed new techniques for optically recording data on missile flights, including the new vertical angular lines on the V2 fuselage and painting the missile's fins black and white, a flat black and white paint, uh, to allow for more precise optical information gathering. In 1950, Dad moved to the position of optical physicist in charge of optical and photographic res uh, research at White Sands. In 1952, Dad returned to Lowell for several months to conduct preliminary work for a survey of proper motion stars. In 1953, he initiated a near-Earth satellite search for the Army to determine the location of any orbiting objects that would interfere with man-made satellites. In 1955, the Natural Satellite Search Administration was moved to the Physical Science Laboratory at New Mexico State University. This is a photo of the building that they first moved into. Anybody that's been to New Mexico State now knows that the Physical Science Laboratory is very similar to this structure with all kinds of uh, meeting halls and lecture halls and so forth. A search for natural Earth satellites was expanded from 1956 through 1958, which included a vision that they wanted to get of what they can get near the equator. So they moved part of their search to Quito, Ecuador. And the projected extension uh, was originally scheduled to be terminated in 1957 to photograph, but it was extended to 1957 to, to photograph this critter here, which was Russia's Sputnik satellite. The final report in the 1959 concluded that no near-Earth natural satellites existed and the next phase of the space race should proceed. And during the 1950s, Dad appeared on several television shows, including We the People and I've Got a Secret with Gary Moore. Now then, may we have our next contestant, please? Would you come in? <laughs> Will you tell the panel, please, what your name is and where you're from? Professor Clyde Tomball from New Mexico. This is Professor Tombaugh, T-O-M-B-A-U-G-H, and he is from New Mexico. Now, Professor Tombaugh, if you'll whisper your secret to me, the folks at home would like to know what it is. It's a plant. It is astronomy, astronomy, but it took us so long to get that, we haven't time for the rest of the game. Will you tell them what your secret is, sir? I discovered the planet Pluto in 1930. Here is a picture of the sky as it looked that night. The first most obvious question, sir, is what is this blob? It looks like the CBS eye, but I'm sure it isn't. Uh, this is a third magnitude star, uh, not very bright to the unaided eye, and is the only object on this entire photograph which is visible to the unaided eye. In other words, this picture was taken by uh, a magnification. If we're not for the magnification, you could see none of these other dots. You could only see this one. Right. All right. Now, uh, this area of the sky, how many, well, for, for the purposes of an ignorant layman, I'm going to call them all stars. I know that the other ones are nebulae and one thing or another, but let's call them all stars. How many dots are there on here? How many bodies are there? Approximately 10,000. 10,000. Well, now, this being this rather puny third magnitude star, where is Pluto? Uh, Pluto is this little object right here. Oh. I don't know whether you folks at home can see that. It's about the smallest spot on there. In fact, the whole thing looked like somebody uh, sprayed milk through a screen door. Uh, Pluto is there. Now, out of all of this mess, how did you find this one little thing? Uh, this photograph was made on the 29th of January, 1930. On another photograph made six nights earlier, it was up here. This little spot was up here? Yes. Everything else, in other words, in the earlier photograph moved, of course, it all, as it always does, but it moved all within the same relationship to each other. Yes, uh, nothing else on this photograph moved. Nothing except, changed? Except Pluto. Except this one dot. How could you possibly notice that this one little dot had moved? 
Uh, we examined those photographs on a, an instrument known as the blink microscope, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, in effect superimposes them, and you see one plate, then the other in succession. Uh, anything that has changed or moved uh, makes it stand out more vividly. All right, so now you discovered, you discovered Pluto. You looked in the thing, you, you found a new planet. Uh, how long had it been since a new planet uh, was, had been discovered? Uh, the planet Neptune in 1846. Oh. So you did, in spite of the rapid advance in science, you discovered the first new planet in almost 100 years. Yes. Well, now, uh, what, what did you do? You looked at it, what, you, you can't just run upstairs and say, hey, fellas, look at me, I discovered Pluto. <laughs> what, what did you do? Well, the first thing, uh, this satisfied the test, the, the thing I was looking for, and then I uh, uh, looked at some other photographs. We had another instrument attached to the other one, which also took photographs at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always the possibility that this could have been a mere photographic defect, but it showed in the right place on with the, uh, a photograph taken with the other instrument also. Well, who named it Pluto? Uh, this was a joint decision of the Lowell Observatory. From 1958 to 1973, Dad led a photographic patrol of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Well, of course, uh, heaven is no place in the space out there. I don't know where it would be. Uh, there's one place I think they could say where, where hell is. That's on the planet Venus because the temperature is 900 degrees and no water, and it rains sulfuric acid. And the atmosphere is 90 times more oppressive than here, so that's a good place for hell. This is the next planet over. Northern Arizona NAU University awarded Dad an honorary doctorate of astronomy in 1960. From 1961 to 1970, Dad taught half-time and conducted planetary research half-time at New Mexico State. In 1968, Dad submitted a request for preliminary accreditation for a degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Astronomy at New Mexico State University. NMSU created a Department of Astronomy in 1970 and established a PhD program there at the same time that the uh, School of Astronomy was established. The Clyde W. Tomball Observatory was dedicated on the New Mexico State University campus in 1972. Dad returned from NMSU in 1973 as an emeritus professor of astronomy. After retirement, Dad made many appearances at NMSU classes as a guest professor and continued his search through the heavens with his home telescopes. I have this feeling of a wanderer. I like to kind of look in there and just sweep around through the Milky Way and say, oh, there's hundreds and hundreds of stars and star clusters. It gives me a, a feeling of great elation. It's a therapy for me. Uh, just idle, plowing through the sky, you know. It's fun. And I wonder what all the wonderful things that must be going on there that we don't see. Realizing there are thousands and thousands, millions of alien civilizations out there doing things, so maybe something like we are. This is something you think about. In 1980, uh, Dad completed the book, Out of the Darkness, The Planet Pluto, as an autobiographical account of the discovery of the planet Pluto, and it was published in, with a co-authorship from Patrick Moore from England. In 1986, Dad and Mom and Bernie McNamara, who was a professor at the university, started a nationwide lecture tour to raise funds for the Tombaugh Scholars Program at New Mexico State. The program supplements finances of guest astronomy professors and postdoctoral students and graduates that the fund now stands at about $1.7 million. So they did a lot of work. Dad loved teaching and the process of learning. One of his brightest stars was the dedication of the Clyde W. Tombaugh Elementary School in Las Cruces in 1990. Dad was inducted into the Academy of Achievement in 1991. The podcast videos in this presentation are from the Academy of Achievement and are available on their website. Dad made over 50 telescope mirrors and lenses and finished do dozens of working telescopes during his lifetime. This is Dad's Richfield telescope that he's holding, and we'll discuss that a little bit in a minute, and the seven-inch reflector that he made for his uncle 
and it was his third telescope. Um, and it, like we said, was a very excellent telescope, and that's really the telescope that he used to learn how to determine the optical curvatures that he needed for the perfection of the instruments that he wanted to use for special interests. Dad built this 12-inch Newtonian reflector about in the 1940s, and the telescope framework and the viewing, viewing platform, it was all made out of wood. And the whole structure deteriorated so much because it was housed outside without a dome as that Dad finally had to disassemble the whole apparatus, and he used the optics for other projects. Uh, the telescope on the left was Dad's 5-inch Richfield that he built in 1933. Uh, as most of you know, the Richfield telescopes have a very wide field and are excellent for certain types of observation. This was the first Richfield telescope in the United States. And the mirror was made from Dad's first telescope, the failed 8-inch. And Dad used a coffee can and carborundum in the kitchen to grind the disc out for the 5-inch that he adapted later for the mount that it's on now in probably about 1988. The middle telescope is a 6-inch reflector Dad built in 1975 for general teaching purposes. The counterweight is the shot put that he used in his high school track and field events. <laughs> the telescope on the far right is a three-inch refractor Dad made in 1933 from discarded military camera parts. He used this telescope as a finder for his double 16-inch and for casual lunar observation in its current configuration. This is the 10-inch reflector uh, that Dad finished in 1944. He ground and polished the mirror in evenings during the World War II. Dad placed the telescope on a Dobsonian mount in 1985 and placed the whole apparatus on an old lawnmower for portability. The telescope gained fame as the Grazer Gazer, <laughs> for obvious reasons, and is now displayed at the Museum of Nature and Science in Las Cruces, New Mexico. This is my 9-inch uh, reflecting telescope. A, uh, drawings I made of Mars and Jupiter with this telescope in 1928. I sent the Flagstaff, and they were impressed enough with them that they offered me a job there, and that's how I got onto the Pluto project. So this telescope really was the one that launched me into professional astronomy. This big one up here is a 16-inch F10 Newtonian, a very powerful telescope I use for planetary observations and also the moon. Now this is a 6-inch monitor telescope. This is a finder. See that aluminum thing? Uh -huh. It measures the angle from the zenith, from the meridian. Now it's on the meridian. So you see I use tin cans to cover up my optics. Most of my observations are just visual, and I just do this partly for the fun of it and partly to keep up with what's going on in the planets visually. This is when I wheel around to dodge trees and lights. And there's, a, there's a mirror down there. It's a 10 inch F5. So you see, you can wheel around different places, different elevation angles. A little lawnmower. This is my portable telescope. <laughs> oh, I had that, uh, about that in about 1944. So you see, I had to be a scrounger and, and uh, invent a lot of these things. <laughs> Innovator. Our son is going to be so uh, peculiar as to be the only one out of, out of uh, uh, well, Octillions of stars uh, be the only one having a planet life on it. That's totally uh, against the odds. Even if you have only one star out of 10,000 that has a planet that is right for life, uh, the number of stars in the sky we know now from sampling with the big telescopes, there are a number of stars that's 10 to the 21st power. Now, you, that doesn't mean anything to I tell you that the number of grains of sand on all the Earth's ocean beaches is only 10 to the 19th power. So there are 100 stars for every grain of sand in all their oceans and beaches. Now, now, they're not all sterile, then. How could they be? We have to realize there's this enormous potentiality of trillions of planets out there with alien civilizations on them. We are not the center of the universe. We're not all that important. 
and we're not alone. So that's my perspective. Mom finished the design of a stained glass window honoring Dad's life in 2001. Artist Art Totowski produced the window which was placed in the Tombaugh Gallery in Las Cruces. A lengthy effort by Alan Stern enabled the launch of the New Horizons spacecraft in 2006 for a nine and a half year journey to Pluto. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of NASA's New Horizons spacecraft on a decade-long voyage to visit the planet Pluto and then beyond. Two plus 15 seconds. Everything continues to look good as the Atlas V vehicle climbs away from Florida's east coast. The five solid rocket strap-on boosters are burning just fine, sending the New Horizons spacecraft on its way to the very edge of our solar system. A small portion of Dad's ashes uh, were placed on the uh, spacecraft. The inscription on the capsule reads, interned herein are the remains of American Clyde W. Tombaugh, discoverer of Pluto and the solar system's third zone. Adele, a Miron's boy, Patricia's husband, Annette and Alden's father, astronomer, teacher, punster, and friend, Clyde W. Tombaugh, 1906 to 1997. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a note, my sister and I learned a lot of things that we didn't know about our dad's life and had never come up in family conversation at family meetings, at dinners, um, and what not, such as just idle times that we spent with dad talking about things in general. We learned a lot of the information that we now know from the book Clyde W. Tombaugh, Discoverer of Planet Pluto, written by David Levy, of Schumacher Levy fame, and published by Sky and Telescope. And our sincere thanks to David Levy, who I understand can't be here today, and who has spent many hours in conversation with our father, and both our mother, uh, and sometimes with us. Yes, he to became almost this a member of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and this book, to our knowledge, is the most complete biography of my dad's life. Thank you. So what's going to transpire from here is that I'm, I'm going to spend a little time uh, uh, helping us get to know uh, Alden and Annette a little bit better. Now I don't have to click this to make you change your... Okay. <laughs> no. no I just wanted to check. I'd probably resist anyway. <laughs> I, I think we'd like to start by finding a little bit about you yourselves and, uh, and maybe how your dad's fame and his background might have influenced your, your careers. Uh, you know, Annette, as the elder sister, let's, let's start with you. Well, I became a teacher, and I taught everything from kindergarten through college. I then went into private practice, and I taught children with autism and other special needs, as well as gifted children. My dad's interest in teaching and his love of, of people uh, influenced my career choice. I also uh, started working in my early years for PSL, Physical Science Laboratory at New Mexico State University on the Vanguard project, which didn't get where it was supposed to go. My job was to read star charts in the process of establishing a navigation for that uh, satellite that was planned. 
So that was sort of where I went. I also majored in uh, biology and pre-med in college, so my interest in science was stimulated by my father. My interest in the arts was stimulated by my mother because she was an artist. Yeah, I can't say that uh, a lot of my dad's activities stimulated the direction that I planned my life. And a lot of that was because I saw the amount of time it took him to be dedicated to that type of thing. And it was too darn cold that late at night, you know? So, <laughs> so I, I went a different way, and I went into banking and was a banker until I retired um, sometime after 2002. And then I was a construction contractor and um, I do all the bottle washing for my, ga my wife's private practice in educational diagnostics, so I do all the books for her. Um, the influence, uh, aside from not wanting to freeze to death in the cold, uh, the, the, the chemistries and that type of thing may have landed a little bit into what my hobbies are, which are building race cars and racing cars, uh, because I enjoyed the idea of internal, internal combustion explosions. <laughs> and yet you, you helped your father uh, when you were young, building his 16-inch, and, uh, and I think you helped him disassemble it when it finally had to come Well, out. my sister actually helped more in the disassembly. We did help build the telescope, as we did with a lot of different things that he was involved in building at that time. So we did get some hands-on activity. Yeah. Now, we, we've seen several times the, the window that finally ended up in the, um, in the gallery. It, which should have been there. There you go. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that the depiction of your dad there in the, on the right-hand side is not of him looking through a telescope, not of him going blind in the blink, blink comparator, but of actually grinding a telescope mirror, something I think that's pretty near and dear to all of our hearts. What do you think he would want to be remembered as? A telescope maker, the discoverer of Pluto? What is in his mind, would his legacy preferably be? I think that teaching was, and working with people was what he'd really like to be remembered for the most. Hmm. I think that's true. He, he enjoyed teaching. He enjoyed the process of learning. Uh, so that was probably his biggest legacy. Uh, Dad was a perfectionist. He had to be in order to accomplish what he accomplished. And he always wanted people to do their best. And if they didn't have the tools or the mindset or the education to do their best, then he thought they should learn how to improve themselves so that they could do their best. Hmm. All right, so your mom and dad were married for 62 years before he died in 97. That's right. Uh, that's a very long time to be married. Give us a little insight in what your family life was like. Uh, did, you, did you spend a lot of time together? Did you... was what was conversation like around well, the dinner the, table? The conversation was uh, of any subject you'd like. With having a mother that was into philosophy and the arts and a father that was into science and perfectionism, we had a lot of discussions about uh, history, geology, astronomy, um, just any subject would come up in our family. Sometimes the discussions got quite, quite loud. Uh, some people didn't understand our family style and were a little aghast by the lively discussions we had within the family. Uh, we often went camping with my father when he was searching out other telescope sites. Our vacations were always either interested in going to the farm for the wheat harvest or in going out with the telescopes, and Alden and I uh, were sort of curled over telescopes in the back of the seat any time we went anywhere. Dad taught me geology with both hands off the steering wheel while going down canyons and showing me rock strata and wondered why I had stomach aches on every vacation. So maybe that gives you a little insight into what our family was like. <laughs> One of the things that I remember, and my sister and I have discussed this in the past, is that dad would go outside and do some preliminary observ observing in his uh, home telescopes, and he'd come running in and tell us to come out and see what he just saw or look through the eyepiece, and we had no clue what was there, but we said, oh, fantastic, because we were, we were just dumb, weren't we? Well, we were kids, yeah, just like kids. other kids at that time, you know, you, you do... Um 
try to be interested in it. And Dad always would report every night at the dinner table how many new screws he had put into <laughs> his big telescopes down to the very last count. Uh, we always nodded appreciatively and listened to his reports. Uh, so it, our family dynamics is that we worked, all of us, as a team. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that I also remember was Dad looking at me one time and he says, you know, I just don't understand why you want to race cars. <laughs> it's in the blood. Yep. So, uh, you know, I think most of us know the, the, the sketch of the story of his time at Lowell Observatory. At 28, he built his nine-inch telescope. At 29, I'm, I'm sorry, 1928, he built his, his telescope. 1929, he moved to Lowell. 1930, he discovered Pluto. And I think that's the, the part that most of us know. And I think we have this impression generally that both your dad and your mom were sort of these simple Midwest people caught up in the, the, the sweep of this discovery. But we got a hint of it on the, on the video. He knew immediately on those discovery plates that this was a trans-Neptunian object that he would discovered. Uh, and he had a sense of how bright it should be. Um, and, and from what I knew of him, he was a scary smart guy. And, and, and your mom was brilliant in her own right. Um, did that imbue your lives and, and give you a, a focus going forward? Did he talk about being the discoverer of Pluto all the time? Or was there the, this, this other academic side to him, the teaching that took precedence? Um, I think there, it, he did not talk about much about the discovery. He talked about his current work that he was doing. He particularly liked working with Mars. Um, I worked with him in the observatory at the Clark at Lowell as his go-fetch person. Um, our whole lives were not so wrapped around Pluto unless we were out in public. We, had, we knew we had to share Daddy with everybody else. And if you wanted to talk to him sometime, you needed to stand in line too. Um, so it did affect our lives, and it surrounded us with people that were very interesting, like Werner Braun Braun. Uh, Kuiper. We spent time at uh, McDonald Observatory in Texas. My, my parents took me out of school, and uh, they said they were going to homeschool me, but that isn't really what happened. Um, things like that were part of our lives. Astronomy was always there. Uh, we were always grabbed to go out in the backyard. My dad had lots of friends. There was very little privacy in our house. Um, <laughs> because there were always people there. Now, Alden, did, did, you ever, did he ever talk much about what he imagined Pluto to be like? No, not really. Um, of course, you saw the, the little blurb that was our latest picture before the New Horizons that Alan showed before. So we really didn't know what Pluto looked like or what to expect. And the technology at that time uh, could afford very little information as to what it was composed of. Uh, so he didn't really talk that much about it. He talked about its position. He talked about the fact that there may be other objects out there. Uh, he talked about a lot of things like that, but not specifically about what he thought Pluto was like. Mm. Now, Annette, you, I've, I've heard it said that um, thank goodness that he got the scholarship to Kansas University because otherwise he'd have never met your mother and you wouldn't have existed. That's right. <laughs> but you were, you were six years old when you finally left uh, Flagstaff. Flagstaff. Do you have any recollections of what Flagstaff was like? Oh, the... yes. Uh, you know, Flagstaff's kind of my second place to be in my heart. Um, I remember a lot about Flagstaff, about um, going up and down from Mars Hill, about being in the observatory with my dad, about the administration building. Lowell had a wonderful library, and I kind of snuck in and had my fill of reading some of Lowell's books, and I got kicked out of the, um, one of the areas there for the study because I started reading ephemerises, and they wouldn't believe that I really was reading ephemerises. <laughs> so um, that, that was, Flagstaff was to me my childhood, and having to leave there broke my heart after World War II and moving to California. Our California year was not the best year in our lives. Uh, not because we didn't like California, but we were just in such transition, and I terribly missed Flagstaff. And I was five years old and 
had to change schools frequently at that time. So it, it, there's rough spots too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know your, your dad was a horrible punster. He would go out of his way to set me up for something. And I'm gonna put you on the spot here a little bit. I know one of his special weaknesses were crow jokes. Crow jokes, right? So for example. For example, I, if I had known you were gonna ask this, I brought with me, it's, it's somewhere in my briefcase, and I'm not gonna go get it, don't worry. All right. A whole list of his crow jokes. He loved crow jokes. So we'll end with three, and I'll start. Okay. Why does a crow have black feathers? Because of its chromosomes. <laughs> Annette, you got one? Where is the favorite place for a crow to entertain? I don't know. A crowbar. Oh. Well, that was mine, so now what do I do? <laughs> uh, yeah. Next question. All right, we'll leave it at that. Quick. I want to thank you very much. The telescope has revolutionized the human experience countless times since its creation some 400 years ago. Celestron is doing our part to continue the evolution of the telescope and expand the horizons of the human mind. For decades, Celestron has been committed to providing individuals with high quality telescopes and optical instruments at affordable prices. We strive to clear the way for intellectually curious people around the globe to experience and explore deeper into nature and the cosmos. When I think of Celestron, I automatically think of the people. Um, to me, a company is people. We have people that are passionate about what they do, and we have extremely talented individuals that work for this company. And I think it takes those, um, those intangibles to create great product. Founded in 1960 in Los Angeles, California, Celestron has been an industry leader in telescopes for over 50 years. As the world's largest telescope brand, we continue to develop technological innovations that set the pace of the industry. Celestron is synonymous with inspired design and state-of-the-art technologies. As an industry leader, we strive to remain the world's most innovative telescope brand. As a rapidly growing outdoors company, Celestron focuses on products that enhance the exploration of the great outdoors. As a champion of STEM education and the arts, we pursue the advancement of public scientific understanding. Our long-standing track record supporting astronomy, education, and outdoor-related nonprofits across the globe speaks to the values we hold dear. Celestron is committed to encouraging the exploration of our natural world in fun and unique ways. There's like a lifetime of good memories at Celestron. It's probably one of our star parties. I'd say probably at the Badlands when we had in the middle of nowhere a crowd of hundreds 
of kids coming off of school buses, coming up and observing the sun for the very first time through a telescope. I've had so many amazing experiences here at Celestron, from helping assist with the setup of equipment with Stephen Hawking, to the very humbling experience of a standing ovation after we announced to teachers at the National Science Teacher Convention that we were donating the binoculars to them. One that definitely stands out as a uh, as kind of an achievement in my career was when we launched the SIVO telescopes, the Celestron Evolution. That was a really proud moment for me to be able to look at the people that I've essentially had grown up with and spent my career and be sort of at the pinnacle of achievement and be able to sort of unveil that and communicate that to, to all these people that I've, I highly respect and have worked with a, a long time. One of the things that makes a company great is great employees. We just strive to push the envelope to really accommodate the needs of our customers. Those are the keys to what drives Celestron and what makes us successful. Our goal is to inspire a sense of wonder, curiosity, and fun in our communities and throughout our company. We desire to be a vehicle that helps drive humanity's insatiable desire to know the universe. My vision for Celestron would be taking all those qualities, the the company's built upon and taking them into the future, into the next generation. And so we need to be continually evolving as a company. As someone that's been in this industry a long time, I do think that Celestron's best days are now and the even better days lie right ahead of us. We dedicate our work to opening the eyes of the people around the world and enhancing their view of the cosmos into the past and on to the future.